The speaking valve does not fit on the end or the hub of the tracheostomy tube. And this actually happened to me early on in my career where I had a patient that I just used the speaking valve the day before. And when I came in the next day, it didn't fit. And I didn't have enough experience initially to know what exactly had happened. I checked the size of the tube. I checked the brand of the tube. It was a double cannula tube. But what I didn't know was that inner cannulas could vary. And so in this Shiley tube, the 15 millimeter hub, which accepts a speaking valve, had been replaced by another inner cannula, which was low pro profile. And you cannot use a speaking valve on this low profile. So a 15 millimeter hub is required for placement of a speaking valve. So just take a closer look if something like this happens to you and, and probably before you place any speaking valve, you should verify the that there is a 15 millimeter hub available. Here's another problem. The patient could be overreacting to the placement of a speaking valve. This is possible. They're fearful. They don't understand. They've had a previous bad experience and they won't even allow the therapist to try. Um, you have to consider that uh, people don't like to have their airways manipulated. Who would? And, and it feels different. And so uh, the patient may not have had any airflow for quite a while. And um, the sensation of airflow begins to feel abnormal. So um, some of the things that I suggest is not to say, let's see if you can tolerate this but rather use words like, let's see if, how long it takes you to get accustomed to airway, airflow again, and using your larynx and allow a cognitive emotional adjustment to the valve, um, as opposed to, again, saying tolerate, which sounds medical and, and like something physical has to change. And uh, again, remind the patient that airflow to the voice box is normal. And one thing that I have done is to break the process into two steps. I can think of a young patient who'd had a few bad experiences where um, we couldn't even touch the hub of the trach. We, and so we had to, to do this, which basically the Shiley phonate opens up. So the diaphragm, the one-way diaphragm that allows inhalation through the speaking valve and tracheostomy tube, but exhalation closes the valve and maintains that closure for um, speech. This diaphragm can be moved out of the way. And there's a grid here that's basically um, promoted as uh, catching secretions so that they don't get up and obstruct valve function. So again, that's evidence that um, pulmonary airflow and secretions um, come up through the tracheostomy tube into the valve and, and can potentially reach the diaphragm. And I'm going to talk about that a little later. But in this condition with the valve open, when you place it on a tube, there's no difference because you're, you're not doing anything. So I have done this where you can place it like this. They don't notice anything. And over time, eventually, as, as they've gained your confidence and their confidence and uh, that you can close this and they will be able to psychologically tolerate and understand the use of a speaking valve. And of course, you will come across a patient with a tracheostomy tube where the cuff cannot be deflated on or off the vent or ever. This can happen in the event of an absent swallow from a brainstem stroke, and I have a case to tell you about that. Uh, severely stiff, non-compliant lungs that can happen with end-stage COPD, or perhaps a combination of severe dysphagia and the inability to breathe sufficiently, therefore a ventilator is needed. And the purpose of a cuff is for a complete ventilatory seal so that, um, that all the air and pressure can be delivered to the lungs and is not lost upstream. In addition, the cuff, although it doesn't prevent aspiration, 
because the definition of aspiration is is any non-gaseous material that gets below the vocal folds. But in reality, the cuff can kind of keep secretions and things at bay for a while and prevent or let's say delay aspirated material from reaching the lungs where the the problem can really begin. I'm going to show you talking tracheostomy tubes. So fenestrated tubes are not talking tubes, but there are a variety of talking tracheostomy tubes. And you can see that they also come with different angles. Here's a foam cuff. Here's a cuff that is a more cylindrical. Here's a cuff that is more barrel shape. And what all these tubes have in common, once you get the right fit, is that they have an extra line or tube with an opening on top of the cuff. So you can see it here. You can see it here a little bit. You can't see it so well here. It's a simple, simple device. Let me show you how they work. This is a tube, and this is my favorite to use as a talking trach when actually it's called a suction aid. But like the other three on the other slide, this has a tube that goes on the outside. And if you can look here, it, its opening is much larger. And so basically, if the cuff is inflated and all of the air is going in and out of the tube, there's nothing for phonation. So this is example over, over here. If you can get six or seven centimeters of water pressure to the vocal folds of airflow, they will vibrate if they're approximated. And I always used to tell patients whether you like it or not, because it's physics. The key is that this opening has to be open. And so one way to do that, and here it says suction, is to use this line to suction all the secretions off the top of the cuff that may have accumulated in the larynx and below. And believe me, it can be a lot. You, you, you can be surprised at how long you will suction, uh, particularly if they're not able to manage any oral secretions. But if you keep going, eventually you'll tell you can hear and see that you'll be sucking dry air with your suction. So once you have this opened, then using the same port, and this is a thumb port, you can put the air through the tube. It has no place to go but up and the vocal folds, if approximated, will vibrate. You want to be aware of the literature showing that there's a greatly increased risk of granulation tissue formation with this type of tube. And I know many physicians, entire practices that will not place a fenestrated tracheostomy tube because of this risk. There's a problem in that many healthcare professionals don't understand fenestrated tracheostomy tubes. I've been told that they're talking tracheostomy tubes and, and they are not. There are talking trach tubes. Um, some do not understand that the inner cannula itself may not be fenestrated. So you don't have a hole in the tube so that they can breathe around and through the tube if the inner cannula isn't fenestrated. Sometimes it's important to be able to explain the theory behind these tubes because their purpose is for them to be used for decannulation so that rather than gradually downsizing, that you would remove the inner cannula and as I just said, allow the patient to breathe around and through the tube. So this slide shows that this is a fenestrated tube, which is that hole there, but the arrow points to the, the inner cannula, which is not fenestrated. I have been told by respiratory therapists that they thought because it's a fenestrated tube, they could just cap it, but never realizing you have to take the inner cannula out before you do that. One thing that we can do if you get a new patient that and you find they have a fenestrated tube is look, take the inner cannula out and try to look through the hole. If you don't see anything, it's dark, that's usually good, that it probably does fit. If you see bulging pink or bloody tissues, that 
could indicate that the hole is actually in the stoma tract and not in the airway or somewhere else. So you want to let the physician know immediately that this patient is at great risk for granulation tissue formation, which is going to hold up everything in terms of uh, speech and swallowing rehabilitation.